Hello, everyone. Uh, we're live now and we'll wait for people to arrive in the room. We're a couple of minutes early, so it might just uh, take a minute or so for people to start arriving, but uh, then we'll be able to get into it. So first people are arriving in the room now. Hello to those of you who are just arriving. I'm Fraser May from Civil Contractors New Zealand. Got the presenters with me. We're just uh, waiting for people to arrive in the room uh, so we can start the webinar on sustainability and efficiency in aggregate fill and cartage. And uh, yeah, looking forward to, uh, I think what's gonna be a really good session. So um, thanks for coming along. Um, just wait for a minute or so for people to start arriving in the room and then we'll get into it. While we're waiting, I'll just introduce you to the webinar platform we're on a bit. Um, on the right hand side, you'll see a chat function. So a couple of speech bubbles over there. Um, if you can use that to ask any questions that you might have or say hi, you're very welcome to do that. Um, and if you yeah just uh type in there to your to use the chat function to let us know yeah well, any, any questions or thoughts we're quite keen to have that uh it's two speech bubbles on the right hand side and um yeah we're quite keen to get those questions coming through so that then we can um, make sure that we have the answers for you Just wait for another minute or so for people to arrive and then we'll be into it. All right, so we've hit four o'clock now. So I'll just, uh, before we get on with it, remind everyone that you can use the chat function on the right-hand side to ask any questions you may have. And um, we'll do our best to get you the answer. If we don't in, do it in this session, we can try and follow up on it later. So it's really handy for Michelle and myself who are trying to follow up on questions that members may have. So please, I encourage you to use that. Uh, just like to welcome our presenters. We'll do a bit more of a formal introduction later, but we've got myself, Fraser May from Civil Contracts New Zealand, Tom's an advocacy manager. We've got Michelle Farrell, the technical manager. I've got Guy Hockard from, did I pronounce that correctly, Guy? Guy Hockard from E-Road. Uh, we've got Lucy Hawcroft from Kiwi Rail, Chris Brockless from Ge Geosynthetic Partners and National Limited, and Tim D from Fulton Hogan. So I figure we should kick on into the webinar now. Uh, people are going to keep arriving. There will be a recording after this webinar, and we're also going to circulate a few of the materials that we've got from our presenters as well, so uh, that you can share that with anyone that you think needs them. Um, and we'll go from there. So uh first off uh why are we hosting this webinar well we're seeing a few issues i mean uh we've heard from our members in uh for instance the wellington region that it's been really difficult trucks queued up uh congestion a lack of sites uh for fill and um we've just it's just been causing everyone a whole lot of grief so uh we've been looking into what we can do about it why the issues are occurring and and what we can do to deal with it um some of the consequences aren't great so you know if you if you if you're carting a lot of clean fill a long way chances are uh people are going to start taking some measures that aren't quite right whether it's stockpiling whether it's fly tipping whether it's uh paying a heck of a lot of money for clean fill to go to landfill none of those are good outcomes uh so you know we really need better ways to deal with them so um kind of what we're trying to do is to facilitate the conversation and move things forward a little bit i might just uh hand over to michelle to talk a little bit more about what we're doing in that space if you want to um, talk a little bit about the solutions that we're kind of aiming towards and how we're facilitating the discussion michelle go ahead thanks yeah so um we've heard a lot of really good um initiatives that people are doing out there in the industry and i just thought it'd be a good opportunity to get a few people together um bounce some ideas around and see how people can come together and whether there's um, things we can learn from each other um so obviously the idea is that um we're managing a resource so good resource management trying to minimize waste and we're looking at that in the aggregate and fill um, area in particular cartage volumes and fuel use we also um, have 
uh, driver optimization, sort of route planning aspect, um, geotextiles to reduce having to excavate, um, you know, soil. Um, and, yeah, really trying to look at ways to um, increase the lifetime of our landfills so we don't have material that doesn't need to be going to landfill going there, reducing cartage, um, uh, you know, fuel use and the damage to roads and that sort of thing from, from cartage, as well as obviously cost and productivity. Mm. Um, so I think I probably covered that, but um, yeah, so so Tim from um, Fulton Hogan's looking, he'll, he'll give a good introduction anyway to um, management of waste around New Zealand. Um, we've got uh, Kiwi Rail on the client perspective of um, sustainable project delivery, so that's Lucy. Um, technology, obviously, um, with uh, geotextiles and GPIL, and Chris. Um, and then, um, yeah, planning around reusing fill on site, so smart ways that we can do that. Um, and then we'll finish with a few Q and A. So feel free to put your questions in the chat, and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. So this is who we have, which we've already introduced, and I think we can get into it with Tim. Yeah, great. That sounds good. And uh, just encourage uh, everyone to use the chat function for the Q and A on the right hand side. Uh, and presenters, if you could turn your video off while others are presenting, that'd be great. Thanks. Take it away, Tim. Thanks, Fraser and Michelle. Um, so as Michelle mentioned, it falls to me to give you a bit of an outline of the, the waste framework and, and why we are in the space that we are um, in New Zealand with, with surplus materials. So um, some of you may know that a, a couple of years ago, the Ministry for the Environment finished a piece of work revising New Zealand's waste strategy, and they made some pretty... Um, bold, um, they set some pretty bold goals in, in that document. Um, primarily among them was that by 2030, New Zealand uh, would have implemented the infrastructure to enable a circular economy for all materials, and that by 2050, we would have reduced waste to landfill to a uh, effectively zero. At the same time as they revised that waste strategy, the changes to the waste levy occurred that brought a new definition for clean fills and also redefined uh, the existing clean fill operations as genuine waste operations. And so there's this policy level driver um, at government to um, effectively shut down clean fills across New Zealand by 2050. Right. Um, and, and they have good reasons for, for wanting to attempt that. And, and, and these two um, images really, really speak to that. So New Zealand is the second most wasteful country in the OECD um, at about 689 uh, tonnes of material per person against a Canada, which is closer to 400. And if you dig into the waste data enough, um, you might come to the same conclusions that I have, which is that 2011 is really the year where, where things went wrong for, for our waste uh, strategy in New Zealand. And that year is important for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first in my world is that that happens to be the year that the National Environmental Standard for Soil Contamination started to be felt in New Zealand. And then the other reason is changes to engineering codes following the Canterbury quakes earlier in the same year. And what you see from 2011 is an increase by about a third of soil materials going into class one landfills alone and you start to see a proliferation of other fill sites opening up around New Zealand. So if you take that material out then suddenly New Zealand stops looking like the second worst in the world and starts looking a lot more like Canada or Korea. Right, next slide. So these are the changes that were broadly made. So we had class A and class B Landfills, we now have class one and class two. They're, they're similar enough that you can think of them in the same way. Managed fills existed and were established in Auckland and Canterbury and a few other regions. They're now formalized across New Zealand. And what we used to call clean fill is now effectively controlled fill. So what that means is that the government collects a $10 a tonne tax on all material going as controlled fill. 
and they've introduced this confusion of the new definition of clean fill, um, which is virgin excavated natural material only, um, that hasn't been engineered. So it, because if it was engineered, then it would be earthworks. And so it's, if you can imagine a, a, a valley that's just being end tipped into with random soil materials, that's, that's what a clean fill is, is now. I'm not sure if any true clean fills exist under the new legislation. Um, I certainly haven't seen one myself. Um, so what can we, we do as, as contractors? If you think about that um, avoid and reuse space, that's, that's really a space for clients and designers and occasionally as, as contractors we might get an opportunity to, to help them with that. Usually by the time a civil contractor is turning up, a resource consent and a design is in place. And turning around and saying actually we want, don't want to do any excavation we want to completely change the earthwork strategy is, is not normally something we can accept but it's important that we understand that that those options exist if we do get the opportunity to influence them um, more realistic for us is the the recycling space so soil washing is a well-established technology internationally it does require quite a bit of capex and space Soil mixing is something we've been doing in New Zealand for quite a long time. So you, you take different soils with different properties and try and blend them together into something that um, might be usable as a, as a product. And then obviously we're very familiar with, with landfilling, um, which results in this kind of picture over here eventually. Um, a bit more interesting looking looking to the future is this is where we, we might see New Zealand going. So this picture here is from Melbourne and Altona. I understand that a couple of these plants have recently been bought by Hydrovac contractors in New Zealand. And so here Hydrovac materials are brought in, the liquid component is treated, and then the solid component, which is predominantly sand, is sold back into the market in Melbourne as, as, a, as a recycled sand product. On the day of my visit to that site, they had just been battling a fire at a chemical works. And so, you know, almost no amount of contamination is too much for that kind of plant. But again, capital is required, space is required, and you don't get a lot of product out the door. So it has to be treated as a waste activity rather than as an aggregate sales activity from a commercial perspective. So you can see here, early contractor involvement, alternative methodology proposals if you're prepared to write them, reuse on site if you can, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Um, but again, it's negotiation with clients. And otherwise, we need to think beyond landfills into what reprocessing and recycling technologies might become available to us or are already available. Um, and I think that's especially notable if the government is telling us they don't want landfills to be operating from 2050. It's 2024 now. You might be operating a new one by 2028 if you started today. So you've really only got 20 years to recover your capital investment, which you know for a lot of landfills, that's, that's quite a slim time frame. Thank you. Fraser? Well, thanks, Tim. That's pretty sobering stuff, to be honest. Um, yeah, the, I'm sure I've got, a, I've, I've got a few questions. I'm sure the audience might as well. Um, chat function, I, I just figured out there was a little issue with that where I had to scroll down to see where I could type the comment in. So uh, the two speech bubbles on the right, if anyone wants to ask. But yeah, I mean, I think uh, closing landfills by 2050, um, do you think it's over ambitious? I guess, you know, if they, they haven't made any plans to change that yet. Um, what, what, what do you think? Do you think that might change or do you think that's just the direction we're going? Um, so if you look at Europe at the moment, the only landfills which operate are for waste that they can't burn or turn into an aggregate. Right. So internationally, that is absolutely the direction of travel. And, and some of those countries are very close to being zero waste landfill already. Um, 2050s, I mean, it, it seems close, but at the same time, it's still a long, long way away. And I think with the international investment in the technology, landfills will stop making sense before 2050, I suspect. Um, which is why, you know, for a Fulton Hogan looking at landfills, you get a bit jaded when your return on them is going to be 15 years. <laughs> and there's all that uncertainty in the consents as well. So, um, you know, look at food waste, right, in Auckland. So food waste in Auckland now gets carted to Rotorua for processing into syngas, effectively. Um, and, and so they're trying to eliminate all organic materials out of landfills in Auckland. Aggregates might be 20 years behind, but I don't think they're 30 years behind. 
Wow. Yeah. And I guess um, one thing that's a little bit, uh, look, I mean, we're ready, we're ahead of time, but I've got heaps of questions for you. So we'll save that for the Q&A at the end. We've got one at the moment, which is um, what, 689 tonnes per Sorry, person. Sorry, that, that was year. my error. That's kilograms, not tonnes. Kilograms class per one. person, yeah. 689 tonnes. I'm so used to working in tonnes when I have to go back to the OECD <laughs> data. There, that conversion doesn't happen. All right. So we'll change them, the materials we circulate. No problems. Good spotting there, Mike Children. Thanks for, thanks for that. Uh, we'll just move on to the next presenter, and that is going to be Chris Brocklis from geosynthetic partners international limited um who's going to tell us a little bit about one of the technologies that we can use uh to help offset some of the waste that we've got um i mean i think yeah that, that's uh please please take it away chris you still with us can you hear me can we see you um hopefully uh i've got my video on so not sure what's uh why you can't see me can you hear me i can hear you just fine and if you maybe just try turning the video off and on again that might work give it a quick go Well, can't see yet. Um, oh, well, unfortunately, but we can hear you, so um, that should be should be just fine. So, do you want to take it away with your your presentation on geosynthetics? Yeah, thanks very much, Fraser, for the introduction, and um, I'll remain the mystery mystery man at the moment. Um, look, uh, I just wanted to um, touch on um, a few technologies around geosynthetics. Um, these are mainly around um, saving of space, minimising the use of aggregates um, using um, uh, uh, local materials to, um, to improve things. So next slide, please. Um, we'll touch on a little bit of overview of geosynthetics first, just a, a quick refresh, um, and then I'll get into geotextiles. Um, geosynthetics, amongst other things, can reduce the volume of um, processed rock in a variety of applications. Uh, rock is essentially a finite and precious resource. Um, we need to reduce the space needed for traditional materials. Um, and so geosynthetics have a place to um, um, play there. Um, and we can save time on construction, um, particularly where we've got um, difficult conditions uh, weather-wise or groundwater-wise, um, soil strength-wise. Um, okay, uh, we can look at um, improving the existing local soils or granular material properties um, where we've got poor soils, as I was saying, and we can certainly reduce the carbon emissions and carbon footprint, and um, we can provide for safer containment with some geosynthetics and improved environmental outcomes, all good things in our, um, in our society. Um, if we uh, look at transportation in particular, which is where I wanted to focus, um, and we'll look at uh, geotextiles in a moment, uh, we can improve the drainage um, efficiencies, we can prevent mud pumping, uh, we can prevent the loss of expensive aggregate into soft soils. Um, by using geogrids or appropriate geogrids, we can improve the aggregate stiffness, um, which enables us to uh, uh, use uh, um, either good materials or, or poorer materials. And in total, we can look at saving between 20 to 40% of aggregates, depending on the conditions at, at site. Um, lower construction and, and reduced maintenance costs is the um, essential um, outcome. Just diving back to geotextiles, um, very commoditized. Most of you would have used or come across geotextiles. Um, in my opinion, geotextiles for enroding and unpaved and paved roads are still underutilized. Um, we can look at two key functions where they can contribute. Um, as a separator um, to prevent the loss of uh, expensive aggregate into soft soils um, and ensure the design thickness is made. And, and you can see uh, savings just on, um, substantial savings just on loss of aggregate alone. Um, sorry, next slide. Uh, sorry, Fraser, just go back one. Okay. Um, in terms of being filters, uh, geotextiles provide an important function, and that is to prevent the pumping of subgrade fines into the subbase and base course. We've all seen that on our roads as we travel the, the country. It's been exacerbated through storm and, and wet events, uh, raised groundwater levels, and so on. And when we combine good drainage, particularly geosynthetic drainage, um, with uh, geotextiles in the pavement, um, it means we can get a, a, a pavement that um, provides um, improved structure and longevity. 
Um, the cost of geotextiles these days is very low. Most of your standard NZTA grades are uh, certainly less than a, about $1.50 a square metre, um, maximum $2 a square metre. Um, so very good value for money. Next slide, thanks, Fraser. Okay, um, we'll touch on geogrids. Um, and really this slide says it all when it comes to geogrids. Um, in this slide, you can see a vehicle being supported on four columns of uh, granular material um, uh, with three layers of, uh, of geogrid in there. Um, and we're talking about applications and pavement reinforcement, uh, whether it be road or rail, site access roads, load transfer platforms, uh, or hard stand areas. Um, if we look at unpaved and paved formations, um, again, geogrids can substantially reduce the thickness of the um, sub-base and also reduce rutting. Um, we can see, as I mentioned before, so total savings of the order of 20 to 40%, um, depending on conditions. Um, the message in uh, the slide is that uh, you can see that uh, geogrid interlock with the material is important. Um, obviously, the stiffer the material, uh, the better the performance. And uh, where you've got particularly soft um, soils or particularly high loads, then we can start looking at multi-layers separated by the granular material. Um, the other factor that comes into this is to be able to use um, poorer quality materials that might not might normally not um, reach a uh, NZTA category for that particular granular material. So when you combine them with a geogrid, um, you can improve the property of the materials. Um, certainly the um, higher stiffness, uh, uh, higher radial stiffness and higher junction strengths um, are best. Thank you, Fraser. Uh, just some general slides of um, uh, geogrids and geotextile geogrid composites. Um, most of these slides are um, uh, with composites and there's a reason for that. Um, if you combine the functionality of a geotextile with the functionality of a geogrid, uh, you can really improve the um, characteristics of your pavement and the longevity associated with the pavement, pavement especially in soft, wet soils. Um, and um, this is where um, geosynthetics can, can really Sorry, everyone, I guess we've just lost Chris there for a, for a second. He'll be back with us in a moment. Um, I think that's an internet connection, connection issue, but he's just going to reconnect with um, his, uh, his link. He won't be long. In the meantime, uh, yeah, I can see we've got some questions coming through. So use the double speech bubble on the right to ask any questions that you've got about geotextiles. And Chris will rejoin us using the link in just a brief moment. Um, so, while we're waiting for Chris, I, yeah, here we go, he's back now. G'day, Chris. Sorry we lost you there. You can hear me okay? And we can see you this time, so that's, uh, that's a big advantage. So, please take it away from where you left off. Yeah, apologies, we dropped out there. So, the mystery man is, uh, is, uh, was trying to be even more mystic, but he's, he's back. Um, so, uh, yeah, just carrying on with the uh, presentation, um, if we... If we look at um, uh, these slides again, you can see uh, uh, bottom left-hand slide, um, some good examples of multi-layered um, uh, geocomposites um, and the rest are pretty normal sort of roading and uh, area stabilization, uh, load transfer platform sort of applications. Right, okay, next slide. Um, yeah, again, uh, general applications, bottom left-hand slide. Uh, says it's all says, says it's all about um, soft soils uh, for a railway ballast um, and uh, uh, quite a good shot. Um, infrastructure works with airports, um, uh, as I mentioned before, hard stands and also um, um, working platforms. Um, and for um, yeah, very soft soils, you can see that uh, geogrids have their time and place. Okay, just moving on. Next slide, thank you. I'll um, talk a little bit about GCLs, um, geosynthetic clay liners for the uninitiated. Um, and this is sort of the reverse where we're actually replacing um, uh, uh, layers of uh, compacted clay, or what we know as CCL. So we're talking about applications in landfill, waste containment, 
ponds generally for variety of freshwater or uh, even wetland applications. Um, uh, typically, your uh, clay um, liner would be of the order of one metre thick, um, and good clay these days can be hard to obtain, and getting it at the right moisture content to compact it optimum uh, can be difficult. In some state, some situations, you may need to go to um, uh, lime stabilisation, which is another level of cost and uh, process on the job site. If we go to a GCL, um, geosynthetic clay liner, uh, whether it be polyethylene coated or just a straight GCL liner, we're talking about a material that's typically about six millimetres thick. Um, you need a cover soil on that to give it some confinement pressure, um, about 300 millimetres. And therefore, we can confidently talk about replacing compacted clay liners with um, uh, by saving more than 700 millimetres of space on almost every application you can think of. Uh, this increases the amount of storage space, so maybe that's more water that you can store, more waste you can store, um, um, and it also means less time for construction. The other thing, and uh, just a, a quick summary, is that um, you've got a material with known performance values, something that's of the order of uh, 1,000 times uh, less permeable than a metre of compacted clay. Thank you, Fraser. Great. Um, we're just coming up against time a little bit, Chris. So sorry to do yep. that to you. But, yeah. uh, that's fine. Uh, the last two are just some quick pictures just to show um, soil reinforcement, uniaxials and geostrap applications, um, soft faces and hard faced um, systems uh, where you can contain uh, either good quality or poor quality materials. Thank you, Fraser. Oh, no worries. So that's, a, that's an interesting illustration, though, of how you can, can retain and reuse. So, yeah. Well, good. Um, these couple of slides are in uh, sandy materials for the one on the bottom left and the, and the mid right. Um, and uh, not only can we improve, improve the soil properties, but we can improve the seismic performance of a, um, of a particular location. And that's the last slide. Thank you very much. Yeah, hey, that's really interesting. And I think where we're getting to at the end there around the containment and the reuse and stuff like that is, is, is really interesting. I've got one question for you before we move on. I know we're up against time, but uh, the lifespan of um, the geogrid or geotextile material, what does that vary between? Um, most of these materials have, um, once they're buried in the soil, have got um, uh, uh, certificates and um, extrapolated testing um, that takes them out to a um, hundred year design life uh, for walls and slopes, for instance, reinforced walls and slopes, um, RSS and MSE structures. Uh, that's mandatory to um, have a material that has uh, property performance out to 100 years. Great. I will come back to Matt. If you've got any questions about seismic performance or how geotextiles can really um, save you a bit of waste on site, please put this in the chat function. Thanks, Chris, for being such a cool customer while um, technology wasn't behaving itself there. I really appreciate it. And now we're on to our next speaker, who is Lucy Hawcroft from KiwiRail. Please take it away, Lucy. Um, kia ora koutou, everybody. I'm Lucy Hawcroft, the Acting Sustainability Manager at KiwiRail. And today I'm going to give you a climate client perspective. So I'll, I'll start off by just talking a little bit about some of the key outcomes that we're looking for when we procure work. So this is a slide from our sustainable procurement toolkit and uh, which we just completed at the end of last year. And so it gives you a view of the, the five priority outcomes that we're looking for when we procure work. So, you know, reducing carbon, minimising waste, quality employment, um, partnering with mana whenua to enhance our cultural heritage and supplier diversity. And then you can also see some additional outcomes. But obviously today I'll be focusing on particularly projects where we've, uh, you know, um, uh, achieved resource efficiency or waste minimisation outcomes. And so I guess why is this a priority for Kiwi Rail? Um, obviously, as Tim talked about, it's a priority for New Zealand. Uh, we need to re reduce the volume of construction and demolition waste going to landfill and cleanfill. But also for Kiwi Rail, we do have some unique challenges because we're an old organisation. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of sites with historical contamination that might have been in, in um, operation as part of the rail corridor for, you know, 100 or 80 years. Um, we're also a large user or disposer of ballast information, and you would have seen some nice pictures of that from Chris. 
Um, and I guess like Tim talked about, the landfill levy is increasing and so we're seeing an increased cost uh, to disposal base like you probably are as well. And this photo here, um, the next thing I'm going to go through is just some case studies of projects where we worked with contractors to achieve uh, good outcomes. And then a final side where I talk about what some of the things are that we look for as, as a client. Uh, but this photo just shows you demolition at the hillside workshop redevelopment. Um, we achieved 93% waste diversion during that uh, demolition phase. So yeah, we were pretty, pretty happy about that. Um, and so this is my first case study. This was the redevelopment of Waltham Rail Yard. And essentially we were redeveloping the um, mechanical workshop here to provide a new workspace and to be ready for new uh, diesel locos that will be coming soon into the South Island. Uh, but we had a big challenge right from the start of this project with contaminated land. Uh, we had our initial designs showed that we might have over 8,000 tonnes of material that needed to be removed. The nearest landfill that would take it was one and a half hours away and it was a potential cost of $170 a tonne. So there was a real risk of uh, budget overruns. So um, the first picture is showing you, we, we did a piece of work with HEP who were um, supporting this part of the civil works. They worked with us and ECAM to come up with a methodology for reusing that contaminated soil on site. Uh, we got that approved by ECAN. And then what we did is we wrapped the contaminated material in bitum. So that's the white material you can see underneath the soil. And that was just a great way of containing it uh, without having to truck it all off to a landfill and then replace it with virgin material. Uh, and also as part of our design, we raised the height of the whole site. So that gave us a way to reuse more material on site. But it also had another uh, benefit that it helped make the site more resilient to flooding, which was another issue. So it was kind of like a win, win, win. Um, and then the other picture is just showing you the solar panels that we installed on the top of Waltham, which are now providing most of the power to that site. So that's also an awesome outcome. And then... Just a little bit further on Waltham, uh, another really good outcome that we had, and I recognise, like Tim said, this may not be that common, but uh, we actually had a proposal from the contractor, Calder Stewart, during the procurement stage. They put forward an alteration to the design. And so essentially our initial design, we were thinking we would have to excavate the entire footprint to a depth of three metres, uh, which would have been a huge volume of material being taken out and then replaced. They proposed a more efficient piling solution where we'd put in um, lots of, of steel piles that would go down really deep to the kind of um, about 26 metres. So that achieved the same stability goal, but we didn't have to excavate so much soil. So that was another kind of win. Um, and then this is just another example of a project projects we ran down in the South Island. Um, the challenge here was that we were moving, we had to move around quite a few materials and particularly things like steel spans and casings. Uh, we looked at bringing them in by truck. Some would be coming from as far away as Napier down to the bottom of the South Island. And obviously there was a really big carbon footprint to that. And also, um, you know, I guess some of those other impacts you have like heavy road vehicles creating congestion. So the team came up with the solution where they made a bolster conversion. You can see it, it on the wagons in that top picture to help us carry materials that are not containerized. And so they were able to bring materials in using that and then also take away waste materials by rail. Uh, and we did a, an estimate of some of the outcomes and they were really positive. So reducing heavy traffic from the trucks going back and forward, saving CO2 and also overall about a 70% reduction in transport emissions. So yeah, I guess that's when you do have to move waste around, uh, rail can be a more efficient solution. And then this one is from the rail network renewal that we've been running in Auckland, the really uh, big works that you would have heard about. Um, so essentially we've been going through large sections of the rail line and renewing the formation, which is the aggregate that sits underneath the tracks. 
Um, and we came up with a methodology where, so in the past historically, often there's been an assumption that material in our rail network is contaminated, uh, but that is not always the case. So we came up with a methodology working with our contractors where we would test the material for contamination to confirm how it should be treated. Uh, once we've done that, our ballast cleaner then comes in and sorts through it. Anything that can be reused on the network gets put back. Unfortunately, in a lot of the Auckland network, because uh, it, it's being renewed for the first time in quite a long time, we aren't able to reuse a lot of material. So then our contractors have been taking that material to Hawkswood Civil and Hawkswood Civil, they take the material that is can't be reused and they put it into um, managed fill and then they take the other material and they crush it up and resell it. Uh, so that's worked really well and about 75% of the material that's coming off can be reused. So yeah, a huge volume of material that would have gone into landfill that's that's been um, diverted. And then uh, this is just a final one. This is a much kind of smaller example, but I guess showing that you can achieve good outcomes even with quite small pieces of work. We needed to build some access tracks at Papakura to Pukakoi to get into our construction sites on the rail network. Uh, when we looked at that, we were going to have to bring in a lot of fresh aggregate so instead we shifted and reused aggregate from the site and and moved that to make up most of the um the access tracks and so you can see some of the outcomes we reused about 73 percent of the aggregate 24 tons of co2 saved that was that was from the footprint of bringing in virgin aggregate and the transport and then also uh, quite a significant savings in disposal costs and then this is just final side. What are we looking for as clients? So I guess the big things we look for is that you're making a sustainability a priority, you know, that you're putting forward ideas and that it's clear that you have a sustainability policy, that you are making improvements and upskilling your supply chain. And finally, just having really clear reporting on what you've achieved, like key KPIs and outcomes. So yeah, that's it. Sorry, have I gone over time? To no, no, you're just fine. Uh, I think uh, bang on. So yeah, looks um, looks good to me. We did have a couple of questions coming through, so I think um, yeah, nice many good good examples in there as well. Good to see some geotextiles used as well, right, Chris? Yeah, uh, I think um, you know. There's um, one question. I will just uh, voice this one before we move on. Um, cost different the cost differential for piling versus excavation. Was that what you illustrated before around the Waltham job, or um, how did the costs compare? Oh wow, I see two people have asked about that. Look, I don't have that figure in front of me, but I do remember talking to the project manager Pete and him telling me. That was one of the reasons we we were so keen on that solution was that it did it did create quite a significant cost savings. So yeah, yes, there was. Um. Interesting. Okay, cool. Well, that, thanks so much, Lucy. I thought that, I thought that was an interesting presentation. And uh, now we'll move on to our next uh, presenter, who is Guy Hockard from uh, Erode. Can you see see me? Hear me, Guy? I yeah. can indeed. Can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you just loud and clear. Please take it away. The show is all yours. Right. Thank you. Uh, look, I, I guess uh, great to be here with you today and to share a little bit about what we are doing to help our customers around sustainability. Uh, maybe just to first start around Erode and who we are. So a uh, New Zealand tech company that uh, was thought of or created in the early 2000s, 2009, uh, commercially launched and spring forward 14 years and we look after 120,000 connected devices here in New Zealand with just under 6,000 customers. Um, those customers travel roughly 250 million kilometres a month. So that creates a huge amount of data for us to use in the tools that we then present back to our customers. And the sustainability tool, which I'm going to cover off in a little bit more detail today, is one of those ones that is driven by all this insight that we have. In terms of the vehicle fleet mix that we have, um, obviously nearly a 50-50 mix between light and heavy vehicles, uh, about 25,000 yellow bits of equipment and um, heavy trailers in there, uh, around about 45 um, thousand vehicles alone or assets alone from our civil customers and we support a big chunk of the customers that you support as well so it's a pretty good fit there 
Uh, sustainability and what is it? And it's more than just reducing emissions clearly. So what we are doing is setting about turning or capturing data and allowing you to set some targets around what you're doing when you think about your fleet. And clearly there's a driver in a vehicle and more importantly, a load involved in that. Um, when you think about that extended supply chain, uh, clearly things like your scope three emissions, but obviously your own emissions and forming effective partnerships to make that happen. Um, we believe that transparency and reporting, and it was nice to see Lucy in her previous presentation talk about uh, the value that they place on their customers being sustainable and, and introducing sustainability concepts into their business. Uh, but obviously, there's also the regulatory and, and um, obviously there's an investment in, in technology to make all this work. Unlocking the data and the insights that you create. So clearly, um, when we like to think about this, it's about, you know, for some organizations, it'll be the ability to transition their vehicles to more um, green um, alternatives. So in some cases, lighter vehicles in the EV space and that heavier vehicle space, potentially the um, hydrogen and various other alternative fuels. Um, focusing on fuel or energy consumption. So we want to make sure that we're creating the right, inf um, sorry, the right reporting framework for you to understand what those are and how they're affecting. And the overseed, overspeed trends and effects on emissions, your utilization, clearly there's a really good example where, you know, essentially if you're looking to go from A to B, there'll be certain times of the day that are much more practical for you to implement that movement based on what else is going on in the network around you. Managing or keeping on top of idling and putting idling into a framework where we're talking about what the real cost of that is and rewarding drivers for being the eco warriors that we want them to be. Um, clearly, there's an opportunity when you get the utilization and everything else working correctly to think about fleet size and fleet reductions and that vehicle transition component as well. Um, in, inside of our uh, My e Road portal, we've got a sustainability uh, module for you with six dashboards. But essentially, what we're looking to do is give you that overview and giving you the ability to look at what's going on across your fleet but we're bringing the power of all of our customers across America, Australia, and New Zealand, and we're doing like-for-like like industry or benchmark industries. So when we think about our civil customers, we're not trying to compare you to transport. We're comparing you to people who actually look a little bit like you. But when you think about emissions, fuel economy, harsh driving, uh, the effect that the driver has on the load and what they're doing, unproductive idling and vehicle replacement, there's a very good analysis for you to work through with all of those components. I want to just dive into a little bit more about understanding absolute emissions and obviously emissions intensity. So as your uh, fleet grows, clearly your emissions are going to go up. But if, but if you're managing the emissions well, then the absolute emissions and the emissions intensities, you need to be tracking those. Um, and that's what the model allows you to do. We want you to be able to break this into groups and put it into main, meaningful examples for yourself. So potentially our large civil customers will be looking at their northern or perhaps Auckland versus Canterbury from an example of what's going on, but also that ability to compare against your peers. So those insights are invaluable. Uh, reducing fuel, um, clearly whether it's whether it's diesel or whether it's other energy or um, EV, um, uh, sorry, it's about understanding what's going on and what the effect of certain things are on that. So really getting into that idle, tracking idle at a level where you can determine if you want to idle over one minute or two minutes or five or whatever it may be, and the effect of harsh driving. So the framework's there for you to really get a good understanding of what's going on. I want to give you a really practical use of where this technology works and works well. And it's with the introduction of the eHub02 Safe Driver program that we have. So what we've found is that coaching drivers in the moment absolutely changes their behavior for the better. Uh, the example I'm sharing here is one that Downer very kindly shared with us, which was looking at their fleet of 6,000 vehicles. And what we see there is way back in 2017, they'd already introduced our technology, but they hadn't introduced our driver facing technology. And what you're seeing there is in 2018, the introduction of our posted speed. So that's the coaching in the moment effect. And we've gone from probably around about um, at that stage, I'd say seven or eight events per 100K down to well below 0.5 events per 100K. And the really cool thing is they've been able to sustain this. So that sustained recognition over the years has, has continued and they really are doing a fantastic thing in terms of managing those emissions. 
We have a wonderful little thing called a trip investigator. So essentially wanting to visualize all of the journeys that you make and then allow you to model that based on, okay, only certain hours of the day or certain times of the day. So uh, again, this is this concept of whether those things should have happened in the morning, in the afternoon or in the evening and allowing you to make adjustments. But we're really giving you everything there is to know about what's going on on your fleet and then the tools to allow you to analyze it and to report and make those changes. And I think that's me. Awesome. Oh, well, thanks, everyone. I think uh, we're up to Michelle's a bit now. So Michelle's got a little bit of a, a, a bit of thinking about – we thought we couldn't really do the presentation without saying, well, what's CCNZ doing about all this stuff? So I think um, we'll bust through that. Please keep the questions flying through the chat function, and we'll do our best to get to them. I've, I've got heaps, so if you don't put them in, you'll have me asking questions. So, yeah, please take it away, though, Michelle. Great, thank you. That those presentations were really insightful and got lots of um, great examples. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so, what are we doing in this space? We're going to do more webinars like this. We want to do a follow up on this. There's been loads of information out there, loads to talk about. So, to keep it down to you know under an hour has been challenging. Um, articles and interviews will be. Um, you know coming through we're trying to engage with uh, local authorities to see how we can um, team up and and help each other out um, we make submissions or will help others make submissions on um, plans so that so that this becomes known that it is a real issue um, we have a so ccnz has a sustainability committee um, and a couple of subcommittees and those um, we pull together resources. We have a sustainability web page, so that's on our technical page under initiatives, which you can see on the um, bottom right um, photo there. Um, so on there for members uh, re below that, there's um, resources that we think are useful. Um, I think this webinar recording will be on there in the information pack as well. We're also developing sustainability training modules specific to um, civil construction and then I've developed a tool which is called the baseline tools so I'll just quickly whip through that um, it's under development um, should be ready around about May hopefully but it's a way to provide an um, so an easy way for subcontractors to record their fuel use where the main contractor is required to report emissions so there was a bit of a gap um, with that particularly around sort of the yellow gear and, and the trucks trucks and diggers. Um, so if you're looking at the scopes, it's um, targeting those um, fuel for stationary um, equipment on site and then also those scope three transportation um, emissions there. This is an example of a free calculator. So, you know, Plenty of people would have seen this um, and it's great. I just wanted to simplify it and make it super easy for subbies, you know, um, small businesses to to use something without having to understand the entire process and, and how to get to it. Um, so it's reporting on um, kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent in a period and it can be split up in different ways for, per project. Um, or other ways, and it could be you could report on your total annual emissions. Um, it's not certified or anything like that, so it's really just a bit of a band aid, bit of a stepping stone before um, before people want to move to something more, um, you know, official. Um, and it will be free to CCNZ members. Um, so again, just taking into account these things, looking at um, especially the heavy fleet trucks for cartage and splitting between aggregates and waste, transporters and um, road freight, but also looking at light fleet, um, so travelling between jobs, fixed plant on site, so generators and then the mobile plant. Um, these are the things future versions could include quite easily, so the first version will be a prototype to trial um, and then we can add in other things like this fairly easily. And that brings us to um, Q&A. So, yeah. Welcome back, everyone. You. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll get through this. Um, I've got some, yeah, I, I've been thinking the whole time through all the presentations. I've got one for you, Tim. Tim, you're still with us? Maybe everyone can turn their cameras yeah, back on. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll still have a chat together. Tim, um, 
say, say a tunnel, say a road. I mean, if we don't have any landfills, what, what, what are we going to do? Are we going to have to like consider the project being, I mean, you know, if we, being including hills as well as as well as tunnels, or um, how does that work? If we're, if we I mean, if was if there's rock coming out of the ground, we're going to put it somewhere. Um, You're leading to the new tunnel in Wellington, I imagine. Fraser. Sorry. Yeah. Well. Can you hear me now? It's one application. Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, go ahead, Tim. Yeah. Um, so the 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 difference there is currently we think of that material as a waste, right? We're generating it. We don't have a home for it within the project. It's got to go somewhere else. What needs to change, and what's changed in other industries, is you're you're creating something that you don't want, but it, it, that doesn't mean it has no value. So you can amend your design to keep it within there or you can try and find another market for it. In the context of a large roading project or a tunnel, that's a lot of material, right? Mm. Um, and, and so there, there should be a process that has gone through right from the beginning of that project to understand what else you could do with that. So central interceptor at the moment is is an interesting one. So wet drilling cuttings are just about one of the most useless materials you can you can come up with. Nobody wants them, right? <clears throat> um, but I do know that Watercare have been looking at at what they can do with them, whether blending them with their other wastes reduces the risk profile of those wastes. And a lot of work has gone into that, but it's it's all too late by the time that the project is happening. So um, you're, you're right. I. You asked the question earlier, I think, do you ever think we'll get to zero waste? I think we'll be pushed to try really hard. There are some wastes out there which I think are just, I don't have a good answer for the year. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's, uh, that's a good answer in itself. So, yeah, I guess it's an ongoing discussion as well. And, you know, it's the sort of thing that we probably need to be having with clients and um, seeing, well, what can we all do about this to, to get a better solution? That's yeah, right. Great. Um, Peter Goldsmith asked a question in the chat about reusing virgin, uh, reusing material in, in pipes and trenches, which is great. It, it does work well if you've got the depth to do it, but th there's always going to be a surplus in those sorts of projects. So you've got to think beyond the trench to what else does that client have? Mm. Um, so it might be something as simple as raising the level of grass verges or something like that. Right. Yeah, Chris, um, just a uh questions about sort of re reuse and how much like what sort of volumes would you say you can save with um like really inventive use of geotextile and uh geosynthetics geogrids oh i think um most of the usage is um uh, done by contractors uh, when materials are specified but i'd suggest that there's a lot of other applications um uh, where ground is um uh, encountered where geotextiles and geogrids could be used um and also uh, where the contractor could take it upon themselves to save themselves some money. If you think about a half metre pavement, uh, even for an access road, um, and you've got a soft subgrade, your trucks are getting bogged down in it, um, the use of a geotextile and a, and a grid is, is pretty cheap to save uh, perhaps uh, 100 millimetres of, uh, of aggregate and stop your uh, site access problem. So it depends, horses for courses, but um, yeah, there's definitely some savings to be made. Mm. Yeah, just uh, feel free to keep the chat questions coming. Michelle, did you have a few a few set questions that you were thinking of, didn't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. I did have a few questions. Um, I thought particularly some of um, Lucy's points were really interesting. Obviously, we've, you know, picked up on how much, you know, if you, you're piling to 26 metres um, compared to three metres of excavation, um, and it's cheaper to pile. That that really highlights the, um, the 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 scale of of what we could save. Um, so I guess my main sort of the, the question that keeps coming up in my mind is what what roadblocks, what kind of challenges do you guys see that could possibly be removed fairly easily if people were more aware? Um, you know, do you have you have something that's sort of on your mind that you want to just say, look, if, if everyone could just start doing this, please, that would be great. Anyone want to jump in? <laughs> Design standards are the bane of my existence, um, especially where they specify virgin materials only. Um, so TNZ4 builds good roads, 
but good luck trying to get anything that isn't crushed concrete or glass into those roads. So it's even questionable whether you can reprocess an aggregate and use it as an aggregate in TNZ4. And we've had those conversations. So early engagement. Yeah, and Tim, I'd go a step further, just using simple things like I've described geotextiles and geogrids with some of those materials um, to provide longevity. You know, they're, they're not used on uh, often enough. Um, people are constructing in the summer months when the ground's harder and everyone goes, we don't need any uh, separation or reinforcement because the ground's firmer. But, uh, you know, come autumn and winter um, or severe weather events and things change um, and it's too late. You know, you haven't used them in the, in the roads to begin with. Well, I thought that was a really interesting comment, actually, Chris, because how do you get um, reuse specifications in line? So you, you kind of implied that uh, there that, um, you know, geosynthetics and geotextiles might allow you to um, have a different reuse specification around the material for the site. Uh, how, how, does that, how is that possible? How do you work that? Um, testing of, um, of composite materials with the materials you've got in mind to use, um, large-scale triaxial or shear box testing with those materials, compare them to the results you would get with a uh, uh, perhaps a clean uh, uh, NZTA specified material, for instance, um, and you can see uh, whether there's a, a fit or not. Um, so it may be cheaper to construct your pavement slightly slightly thicker or use um, more layers of uh, re you know, geogrid reinforcement to get the same outcome as using a, uh, a, a clean traditional specification. Is there something to be said for performance-based specifications rather than prescriptive? Please. As soon as you can, everywhere. Yeah. Cool. And the other topic we covered, I guess we, we kind of covered a bit of ground there. I think we covered quite a lot of ground. One was fill reuse of material on site. Another was fuel usage and about um, cutting the waste from cartage. So that's the kind of the cartage side of the issue, right? So if we're cutting for long distances, how can we, at, at the moment, how can we offset that? Do you have any questions to ask on that one um, of, of, say, Guy, Michelle? Well, one thing I just wanted to circle back to was Lucy's observation about um, the reduced emissions and I imagine possibly cost um, by carting by rail. I thought that was a really good point. It is something that I have noticed when I've been um, building the tool is how efficient rail is. So it is definitely something we need to keep in mind. Obviously keeps heavy vehicles off the road and damaging that and congestion and all that sort of thing. Um, but as far as Guy, well, yeah, I think it, it was really interesting to hear about the, you know, driver, uh, what do you call it, driver training. Um, and I think that is a really easy way for people to jump on board and perhaps, you know, set up sort of com competitions. I know a lot of people in the industry, you know, thrive on a bit of competition. So is ha have you seen a, a good uptake and is that... Um, is that something you've noticed is real gains being made by sort of making it a bit of a game? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess the concept that most organisations adopt is our technology allows a driver or an operator to log into the device. So rather than trying to report at a registration or a fleet name or, or number, we're able to personalise that to Guy Hockard or Fraser or, you know, Michelle or whoever it may be type thing. Um, that accountability or gamification um, it doesn't really matter if you sort of put the sports analogy there. Nobody wants to be last. Everybody wants to be first. So um, I was out at Foodstuffs North Island um, just a little over a week ago, and I presented an award to their Driver of the Year Award. And, and this gentleman had literally driven 70,000 kilometres this year, error-free. He did the same thing last year. He actually won the overall award last year. So it absolutely can be done. And I think being able to measure and report and show that it is possible is part of the, you know, busting the myth that I have to speed and I have to get there quickly. So what Downer have done and Fulton Hogan and Heb and Higgins and literally all of our customers are doing something similar. They're focusing on what good looks like and we're giving them the tools to say, you're good, 
is really good or your good is not so good because we're then bringing in the peer assessment or the you know the 150,000 drivers that log on to e-road devices every year in New Zealand and we're letting you see how your individuals driver or vehicle fit against those and the the concept of just slowing down and getting there more steadily the flow on effect not only in emissions but in health and safety is immense so we would pr pride ourselves on being the fact that we are making new zealand's road safer and more drivable and and yet we're also helping people be more productive with the utilization and and using the resources they use wisely yeah so we're getting near time we do have a good question in the in the in the mix about from mike southby about um reuse so an issue seems to be the default specification in nsc type structures and everywhere is gap 65 thereby requiring imported new material and disposal of the in situ material so what can we do about that anyone got any ideas or ha has been through a solution in the past for that i just wanted to say that i'm on the um, national pavement technical group and we have um and so is mike chilton who i know is on this call um so i we are starting to look at what specifications are a problem um and and where we can change it so that we're not so reliant on virgin material and so that we can allow for innovation um within the spec so just want to say that but anyone else can jump in yeah, just on um can you guys hear me or i did yeah we can hear you. Yeah. no it's fine um, just just on uh red for soil structures and msc structures which i think the question was geared around um yes it is possible and we have done um uh, reinforced structures with um, uh, in situ soils or soils that might not normally be considered and certainly not gap 65 quality materials so um, it is very possible obviously materials perform differently when they are exposed to water and the whole thing around a reinforced soil block is to control the moisture getting in from the top from the sides um, providing good drainage uh, perhaps putting a gcl at the top um, underneath to uh, at the top of the um, uh, structure to stop water getting in, ingressing etc cetera, etc cetera. so steps can be made to use um, a lot of local soils um, um, and they, don't, they don't all have to be free draining or expensive gap 65 type materials mm. Interesting. Yeah, and it sounds like we need a bit more awareness around that sort of things. Yeah, okay. So um, we're, we're about, at, we've hit five o'clock now, everyone. So um, I, I think I, I always feel really guilty taking people past five. And also um, thanks to our presenters for putting in an absolute massive amount of work to make this happen. I think, um, you know, really, really great to have you sharing your knowledge. Um, we'll share some materials following this webinar so that people that are interested can drill down a bit more into it. So um, keep an eye out for that in your inboxes. If you attended, I know that I got several people saying they couldn't make it, but they watched the replay. So uh, we'll also be sharing that with CCNZ members across the country and um, everyone else. So look, thanks presenters for attending. Um, you know, any questions that for, for any listeners, feel free to address them to um, civil contractors. And uh, from from my perspective, it's been um, really interesting listening to uh, be able to hear what, what, what you what you've brought us for this presentation. So thanks. Um, thanks very much for making it happen. Um, yeah, anything else you want to add to that, Michelle? No, just yeah, thank you so much. It was a, a really big effort and um, for you guys really appreciate it and for sharing your knowledge and I've I've got loads more questions. So I'm sure this conversation can keep going keen to talk about this sort of thing with anyone who wants to um, chew some fat with me. So um, yeah, just stay in touch and keep an eye out on what's going on. Thanks. We'll keep we'll keep working on it. In the meantime, from from, from all of us, um, farewell and um, have a good rest of the evening. Thank you. Yep, cheers. Kakite.